stand, please. Proverbs 18, verse 17. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him altogether. The law causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. That's correct. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We really thank you for uh, this time of the service. We do enjoy uh, singing your praises, giving back to you as yours, uh, coming together. Lord, we thank you so, so much for the opportunity we have to hear your, your word. And Lord, I ask that you please help us all to be ready to receive it. it. Bless, Bless everybody here for their faith in us with that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Let's, uh, well, no, let's go ahead and pray, and then we will get started again. If you want to lower my paycheck this week, uh, because I am using a sermon that I've used four other times in our church's history, um, and today, and then four years ago, I did rework it a little bit, but uh, I'm not sure uh, enough for you to, um, to uh, appreciate it, but we'll see. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, again, we're thankful for our time, a place to meet, and we're thankful for this building. I uh, pray you to bless our time together, help us to learn, help us to apply these truths to our lives and use them, help us to be honest with ourselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look here, Proverbs chapter 18, pick it back up here in verse 7. He is that first in his own cause seemeth just. Uh, you know, that's the thing where, well, you know what, I... I I care about this and not and more than anybody else, right? If you have something that you take up, you know, generally you're always going to care about it more than somebody else is, and you're going to tend to get frustrated when other people don't share your passion for something. Uh, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth them. The law causeth contentions to cease. All right, so you have a problem with each other, you can't figure out what, what to do about something. You know, the Bible says flip a coin. Or casteth lots if you want to. You know, there are times in the Bible where they cast lots for major decisions, and it's and it's even commanded. We call that gambling. Uh, the Bible says that if you have a contention that can't be fixed, you know maybe sometimes you just flip a coin and figure it out. And, uh, and again, I'm not saying that's the first go-to, uh, but and those here, um, the lot causes the contentions to cease and part between the mighty. And look at this, verse 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And so once we're offended, and once that bitterness is worked in, it is so hard for us to get things fixed. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Bars of a castle are supposed to be in, in, impenetra impenetrable. Impenetrable. And um, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. In other words, you reap what you sow. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Again, reap what you sow. Death and life from the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says this, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That bitterness gets down into us and then spreads out. And let's go ahead and pray. We'll get going. Father, again, we're thankful for our time. Pray bless our time. Help us to learn. And uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jack, you prayed for the same service twice. All right. Doubly blessed. And uh, so we can always go to God. Like if I stop in the middle of the sermon and pray, that's good too. So we can go to our sponsor. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, right now, I still haven't figured out what I'm going to do about TV. I cut cable. I tried sling for a bit. I tried, you know, free trials of other stuff. You know, and you go over to YouTube thinking, you know what? I am watching, when I do this, ten times more commercials than I ever did watching TV. 
and you're watching a 30 second video on YouTube. There's a 30 second commercial, it breaks in the middle, you gotta wait for it to load, and then you gotta watch that, and then go back to 15 more seconds of, I just wanted to watch how to you know, replace the key in my, or the battery in my fob. Ugh, anyways. How do we get there? Frank. Frank twice, okay. Many times in the Bible, a progression of sin is downward. We see it all over Scripture. Uh, Romans chapter 1 is, the, I think, the best and clearest example of this. Um, small sins turn into large sins, and in our life, there are many slippery slopes. So sin is a slippery slope, but so is hurt and bitterness. We started this church 17 years ago. It was weird Friday night uh, going up there. Not a lot of people are left from when I knew... Um, you know, because I mean, we didn't help. I mean, we didn't help at all. But we did go up there a little bit more often when uh, our church was new. Uh, matter of fact, this part of the pulpit was given to us by Timberline Baptist Church, and then uh, the wings. You didn't know that this was built over several years, and uh, Chris properly matched the wings on it because you don't want you know a portly guy up here, you know, behind this skinny thing right here. That just makes me look gigantic. But once you start putting you know these nice oak wings on it. I looked a little bit better, so I appreciate that. Uh, but 17 years ago, and uh, going up, uh, of course, you know, it's a different pastor now. None of the staff is left from when we went up. And uh, But seeing Chris Teft again, um, I don't know, if any of you know, I have, when I say a personal YouTube channel, what I have done is taken old VHS tapes and uploaded them. And uh, there are nine or ten videos. It's not like I have a YouTube channel. I just, those things are like a gig each. And so I'm not going to store them on my computer because that would be ten gigs of memory. And I'm sure YouTube does something to make them smaller when we put them up. But I said, because I picked, in our football league for Salem Ministry, you know, I still have to find the video of the, the perfect pass to you, the back of the end zone. He will tell you if he's up here that it was a perfect catch over the top of somebody else. Uh, but anyways, to beat the Dolphins, who ended up being Timberline Baptist Church. And you say, how can a team end up being the pastor and staff of the church? And I agree. But anyways, but, uh, there was one particular pick six of Chris Teft. I picked it on the five and ran it 100 yards. And, uh, well, 95, I guess that'd be for the touchdown. And, uh, but I titled it, Somebody Picks Off Chris Teft. Somebody Picks Off Chris Teft. So then come to find out, he had seen it. Because somebody, you know, because how many times are you going to find Chris Teft and the last name's T-E-F-F-T -F -F -T online, and I spelled it right. He's like, I saw that. I was wondering who that was. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. And I said, shook his hand at the end and said, all right, hey, see you again in another 18 years. And, uh, all right, we'll see you. Matter of fact, he was the one that turned me on to polling for the Patriots. He's from New England, and then our team was the Patriots. Before the 2001 season, you know, the Patriots still lose. They still had Bledsoe. Mo Lewis had not, you know, hit, done that divine hit yet that elevated an entire. Mo Lewis is never mind. Yeah, some know, some don't, but that's okay. And uh, so I asked him, you know, because now he actually pastors outside the stadium. And uh, just because he can go watch games, you know, cut church early, head over there. And um, I said, hey, what was your opinion of uh, Brady? Said, oh, love Brady. And I'm always going to pull the picture because Bill checks fault. And uh, so we had a good conversation. I said, all right, we'll see you in 18 years. Um, but in 17 years of our church, people have come, people have gone, and generally it's not over doctrine. I have, we have, I think, in 18 years, one family left over doctrine. Uh, other than that, I mean, we have people maybe come for a week or two, and, uh, you know, maybe they don't agree with something or whatever. Uh, but our church has never had a huge split. And as I write this, as I uh, wrote this, I'm not aware, in the four other times that I've given this sermon, each time there was a situation in the church that warranted the sermon. That's not the case today. And now I understand, and uh, I was going to say this line regardless of anything that happened today, is I understand there's people in this room, you don't like each other. Uh, you know, Ross was telling me something about Chris the other day, and you know, it was like, you know, what in the world? And, uh, you know, you know how it is. You know, Dave was telling me about something that Matt said to him. And, uh, you know, I understand you have, there are people in this building I don't like. <laughs> no, that's not true. 
Uh, because if I didn't like you, you'd probably know it, and then you would probably not be here, right? And uh, But, see, the thing is, when people leave churches, it's almost always something so small and insignificant that it's forgotten. I don't know if there's only a couple of you that remember, right across the street where that angry lady lives now, there was a Mrs. Marsh that lived there, and man, she was faithful to the church. It was, it was convenient. She was super old, and uh, I'd say she's probably... How old are you, Ron? <laughs> she was in her late 80s, and uh, but it was convenient for her. She could walk across the street. Matter of fact, half the time, one of us went over and you know, gave her the elbow and walked her across the street. But there was another woman in the church that got upset over something. And, uh, matter of fact, her name was Darlene Parmassel. And uh, because I'm still harboring some bitterness over this, and this was 16 years ago. And, um, I mean, we're, we're talking about infancy of the church. And uh, I asked that in our nursery that women dress a certain way. Um, now, whether they do or don't. Matter of fact, I really have come to the point, I don't care what you do over there. Uh, just remember you're watching kids, uh, I guess. And uh, But this, these two women got upset, uh, and they talked to each other, and then the other one got upset. She decided, well, I'm going to go to church out there, and started going to church somewhere out in east, further east Springfield. But then what she was doing is that next week, because she was friends with the person across the street, she went over, picked her up, and took her to the other church with her. Now that works great if you're going to pick her up, but then all of a sudden, you go on vacation. You're gone for the entire summer, which really did happen. Now what? So now she's stuck over there. She can't come over here. She never had a problem with the church, but now she has one because of the, the trips back and forth with this other person and the you know things that are being said. And I remember I went to McKenzie Willamette to do a uh, hospital visit. It was uh, several years later. And I happened to get to walk by that room and see Mrs. Marsh laying there by herself. And just disappointed. Because back then, remember, we could go into a hospital room where somebody's suffering. And because, you know, you should have somebody around you when you're trying to heal. Right? It would have been helpful over there for six days if I could have had somebody there, you know, at least a chit-chat with or, or whatever. But, you know, now we've come to that. But she was laying there. I couldn't walk in. I go talk to her, and as far as I know, she died alone. And uh, I still am angry at the other woman for that. I've never not talked to that other woman in 16 years. I, I don't know if she's even alive. Don't show it yet. But bitterness is like a man throwing his wallet into a porta pot. You know, he takes off his jacket, throws it in the porta pot, and you come up and ask the guy. And uh, so I pulled that first one. I'm, I've got a live look at this guy about to step into the porta potty, and you know what? It stinks in there. And you walk up and say, "Hey, why don't you throw your wallet and your clothes into the porta potty?" Well, I drop my wallet down there, uh, and then but then you go backwards and come to find out. Well, when I was going to the bathroom, I dropped a quarter down there. Huh? So in other, to, in other words, to justify your decision to go chase a quarter, what you did is you threw your wallet. Now it's worth it for me to go down into the porta potty. Now I'm going to take off my jacket, my pants. I'm going to throw them down there. And so now this happens more times than you think. Go ahead and go to the next one here. So here we find somebody who got stuck in a porta potty because obviously what he had done is he dropped a quarter down there and decided to throw the rest of his stuff. And here he has no clothes and he's stuck. You're still sitting there saying, no, that doesn't happen. Go to the next one. You know, this apparently happens. You go ahead and Google people stuck in porta potties. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> You'll open some windows and some things you'll wish you never saw. But so, I mean, look at this guy here. So, you know, somebody drops their quarter into the porta potty, so they throw in their wallet. You can go ahead and go on the black screen there. And they, so then they throw in their wallet. And as they're standing there, you know, it's still not worth it for me to go down there. I'm going to take off my jacket. I'm going to throw it down there. It's still not worth it. I'm going to take off my pants, throw it down there. Now I can't walk home because I'll be walking home in my underwear. It's still not worth it. All right, wedding ring, throw it down there. All right, now it's worth it for me to go down and get my stuff. 
But the whole thing is, all you really did is you went down there for a quarter. But we justify the rest of it by throwing in our wallet, by throwing in our credit card, by throwing in all that other valuable stuff, not understanding that it was all built on a quarter. It's not worth it. I want to help you today to recognize if you might be on the slippery slippery slope and to do something about it. I heard this outline as given in my church that was uh, reached for our type of Christianity back in 1995. My pastor used this outline, this exact outline. You say, you used it four times? Did you study this week? Yes, I did study this week. Um, (laughs) But after the sermon, I was a 21-year-old kid. And Lisa, imagine this, I was 21, she was 19, maybe 20 by that time, barely pregnant with Titus. This older couple, we say older couple, you know, I'm thinking, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, but, you know, now that I think back on it, we're in, the mil- we're in a military church. So these older couples were in their late 20s and early 30s, but we saw it as older couples, you know. You have one striker on their arm, on my arm, and they have, you know, six and seven, you know, and you're just, ooh, ugh. But the guy came up to me and complained that the pastor had followed him around all week and preached a message about him. Every one of you is going to think, matter of fact, we're already, we're we're going to be a little bit late today. Um, Every one of you is going to think that I followed you around this week. Just know about that. But this area will help you in every area of your life, your walk with God, your marriage, your church, your family relationship, your friends, your job. You know, where's the process? I understand it's happened to me. Too. But where's the process where you sit across from somebody and you're wearing a tie, you're wearing a jacket, and you're trying to schmooze them and trying to talk them into hiring you, and then to where now, here you are this many months or years later, you hate the person on the other side of the desk, you won't listen to anything they have to say. What happened in the transition? And all of us have done it. And, uh, and, and so what happened in that process? What happened in the process to where we pledge our life to somebody, I love you, I pledge to spend the rest of my life with you, to the point where we're trying to, you know, trying to decide who gets, you know, the toys, who gets, you know, you know and then one of you ends up taking a sawzall, oh, you want half the house, you can have half the house, then you take a sawzall around the, you know, the perimeter of the house and cut it actually in half. Uh, where, what happens here? What happens to that, you know, that first Sunday when you walk up to church, everything is, ooh, this is fun, to where now, you know, now it's, yeah, I hate those people, and, you know, and that was years ago, and we don't talk to anybody anymore. We like to blame other people for our problems. Then, we like to hold a grudge against them. I hold grudges. Did you, did you know that? Had something happen this week. Opened up some old wounds. You think I'm about to be serious. I am not. Uh, actually, I am serious. Um, but we're on our way back from Roseburg, you know, when we used to go to Sunday nights down there before we started Sunday nights here. You know, I guess I should probably still be doing that. And uh, but it was back when we had the white on the MPV. And we were coming, you know, so we are getting back Sunday late, you know, from Sunday evening church. And we're coming down South A, and I handled the lane change properly. And uh, I got pulled over. And the guy said, well, you made it, uh, you made it, you know, your lane change back there wasn't good and something else. And so basically they were pulling me over making sure I wasn't drunk. It has bugged me for 16 years that they pulled me over and accused me of something I didn't do. And it just happened then two nights ago. I'm pulling out, you know, if you pull out of 35th Street, there's a fence, there's a row of trees, and you know what, you have to be halfway out there before you see anything. So no, I'm not going to, I'm probably going to live in my house for another 5, 15 years based on, you know, refinancing, we'll see. And, but I'm not going to, every time I pull out of my street, stop, pull forward again, stop, hope for clear traffic and go. No, I'm going to pull up to that first one. You know, I'm still not into traffic. And, uh, but, so then I, you know, pulled out and uh, he says I crossed into the bike lane when I did that. You know, did I cross the bike lane? I did stop. I didn't stop behind the stop sign, but he was down, he was three blocks down before he saw it. Pulled me over, and just you know, hey, I saw this, and you know, I'm out here, you know, and uh, you know, I had this other car. I said, I thought you might be drunk, but you did these things. No, I didn't. And it's going to bug me now for the next ten years. So when you ask me in ten years about it, it'll, it'll still be there. But see, a grudge turns into bitterness. 
Bitterness then leads to a loss of all the affirmation, all aforementioned relationships. Bitterness, like the Bible talks about there, bitterness digs deep and then springs out. All these relationships that we talked about here end up severing, but they sever because of anger and bitterness. Bitterness leads to poor health, decline, joy in life, and premature death. You see, as I give the sermon this morning, you're going to think, man, I'm preaching you up. <laughs> I have been down this progression more times. I have sometimes, you know, this heightened sense of justice. Um, you know, I'm still bitter to uh, yeah, part to go to the fair one year so that I could be at a soul winning booth and you know a couple blocks apart they had these signs that said no parking but then there was I mean there was yellow on the curb and then you know the, the there was part of the curb that wasn't painted and I parked there along with a bunch of other people so I got a $50 ticket and man when I got to that judge you know finally man, I was mad about it you know, and I, you know explained it I came with pictures and he's like, I can tell, you know, he said something about, you know, I can tell that you're, you know, a man that cares about justice and all this, but, you know, unless you want to plead not guilty and go before another judge, you might have to pay the full amount. I'll tell you what, I'll give you half off. It's not worth my time for $25 for a non-moving violation, but I was so angry when, we, when I left there. Not really angry like I'm kicking things, but I was angry at the injustice. That happened, what, five, six years ago? And there just it comes to a point where we have to figure it out. <clears throat> that same man that came to me that night in 1995 eventually left the church, I think it was in the next week, over this, and he started on the progression. And you know, you go look down, he's been divorced now for a long time. Uh, the other family that went with them, uh, I think they're still together. It's hard to tell. Isn't it nice that we can, you know search people that we knew 20 years ago and you know figure out things and know what's going on the internet is helpful sometimes but he pulled a family with him and now that family uh, is divorced I stayed at that church I did not listen to them I realized my call to preach went to Bible college and now I am here as your pastor however had I gotten wrapped up in their bitterness like I had at the church before um, then I wouldn't even be here today but it was over something so small and a misunderstanding, but the consequences were huge. Our church spends a good amount of time together. You know, our paths collide a lot, um, which I think is a good thing. But you'll find yourself going down this slope at one time or another. Just remember, as I give you this slope, I've been down this slope several times. Remember, Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bar of a castle. I need two of you. Kiyosuke, mind being one of them? Hey, I mean, sorry, Clay, why did I call you that? One per person. Do you mind? Sure. Go ahead this side. I didn't hand these out before because I didn't want to. Now, I mean, because I also don't want you to try to write down 30 points. And you're going to say 30 points? What, are we going to be here for like three hours? It's possible. Can I make you bitter? Can I make you angry? <laughs> Come on, Clay, speed it up. Yeah, if you go too slow here, then you're going to end up being a point in the sermon. Tristan, you didn't hand somebody yours. You're going to need this. You're half the reason I'm preaching the sermon. <laughs> All right, just set the rest on the table over there. Or you can just set them right there. And you can grab more on the way out because you might need them. All right, you ready to start? Let's hit this thing running, shall we? All right, so remember the quarter that somebody dropped in the porta potty? We're going to start with the quarter that got dropped in the porta potty, and you're going to see later on that people are throwing their wallets in the porta potty so they go chase the quarter. All right, number one, you're going to get hurt. If you've been here for any length of time, That's awesome. You will, if you have been here any length of time, I have hurt you. You have probably done something. I don't know. It's easier for me to hurt you than it is for you to hurt me, basically because, you know, just for any 
reason I have a microphone, you don't. Um, but however, something is said, there's a look, there's a glance, somebody gets promoted ahead of you, um, something in our past, maybe we feel left out. Maybe it's that we have a bunch of deep-seated anger and uh, bitterness and just the mention of a name or something of that nature, then all of a sudden the stuff just wells up. That happened to me like three weeks ago. Just somebody tried to help. And it just, you know, this ugly green ooze just kind of pops up. Now, it, it, well, you know, the pastor didn't call me. That's becoming actually less and less, you know, nobody wants to be called anymore. And... Uh, <laughs> Titus talked to me, oh, well, there's this job, and it's, and it's phone sales. I'm like, Titus, when's the last time you answered a number that you didn't recognize? I don't. Because it's probably, what? A sales call. And it's probably a robo one, so you just let those go to voicemail. That's what happens. Back in the day, the phone rang. We didn't know who it was. Remember that? You're like, ooh, a phone call. And you, you every time, go answer. But uh, you know, here's what this would look like. And remember a trip to Portland, because I drove up to Portland. Pastor didn't ask me to go up to Portland. Something simple. A portal. Pastor didn't ask me to go up. You know, he asked a couple other people. You know, and, and then so we start. You know, well, and that, by the way, that's the first, first real step. The first real step is to stop taking things so personally, and that is really preaching it myself. Number two, you feel that what happened is unfair. Oh, that's just not fair. You know, we've instilled in our kids this odd, you know, from where we grew up to where our kids now, uh, how fair everything has to be. Drives me insane. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know where this comes from, but, you know, everything has to be even. Everything has to be fair. Uh, life isn't fair. But how will we fit? You know, everyone else was asked to go. Again, I didn't ask anybody to go. I was willing to pay people gas money from the, Matt would have shot it down, got mad at me for it. But I was willing to pay somebody gas money to go up uh, Friday, and uh, but you know, ended up getting shot down. And not shot down. I'm just you know, I would have gladly done it. You know, first it was pastor didn't ask me to go to Portland. Everyone else was asked to go. So you feel it's unfair. Everybody else was included. Everybody else was part of this. Uh, maybe something happens at work. Everyone else is part of this. Maybe something in marriage, friendship, whatever the case is. Number three. You feel that there's more to it than meets the eye. The word for that is ulterior motive. You think, I know why he's doing that. You ever do that? Your shower arguments? You know, your shower bottles, man, they, they know every argument that you've ever you know, come up with, right? But you're like, wait, I know why they did that. And you haven't talked to the person. I, I do that. Because when you read enough things into things, occasionally you're right, then get cocky about it. I'm right about these things, right? And uh, you know, I'm trying to study people. That's part of my job. And so then if I'm right 10% of the time, hey, that's a pretty good percentage. <laughs> but here it is. I'm going to figure out why he's doing that. I just don't think pastor likes me. Pastor doesn't like my driving. Pastor doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't think that I'm worthy to drive the teens up. I don't know what other ulterior motive would be, but you know, it's all, you feel that there's more to it than meets the eye. Number four, you start building a case. See, when we have all these points and we're going through them in less than a minute each, that's where we get good. You start building a case. Everything you see, now watch this. Have you ever said to somebody, you're just like your dad? You're just like your mom? Well, what you're doing is you're building a case. You're trying to define somebody and put them into a box because if I can put you into a box, I have defined you, and the better I can define you, the better I can negate you. I think it was Kickergarden. It was Dick Van Patten. There was somebody that said that. You label me, you negate me. You know, in, in politics, this is all over the place. Oh, you don't do this, therefore, you're that. Uh, you don't believe in, you know, in abortion. You know, but however, you know, you also won't take care of them once they're born. Uh, well, that's not necessarily true, but I don't believe in slaughtering the unborn because I can't afford to have them, right? You know, it, the, the stupid arguments. But you start building a case. Let's go back to Portland. See, now we're moving on. He didn't invite me, and now Pastor didn't say hi this morning. <laughs> I, you know, I try to say hi to everybody. I think I do. 
Lisa was mean to my kid at the beginner class. I can use that one because I don't think Lisa's ever been mean to a kid. Uh, but Brooke, Ashley probably would disagree. But, uh, you know, that's part of being a parent. Uh, you know, Lisa was mean to my kid. Well, did you ask Lisa what happened instead of just falling? And, and by the way, none of this stuff has ever happened. I had to make up scenarios. Number five. So you, you spot everything that proves you're right. That's what you say. I knew it. See, I told you so. The smallest thing can prove your point. You start making odd connections. Do you ever do that? I make all sorts of neat odd connections. You know, I saw this happen. Uh, you know, my latest was when you know, I'm up on my roof. And I worry about the COVID mental fog, and I couldn't get a hold of anybody. I'm making all sorts of connections. And by the time the night was over, I had my house sold. I was moving to Idaho. And because, you know what, apparently something happened. Of course, I had the COVID mental fog. That was already happening. Uh, somebody, they got together. I'm getting fired. And uh, so I guess, you know what, this, this refinance is coming at a pretty good time. And uh, <laughs> just something stupid. But again, I was sick, so leave me alone. By the way, when we go back and finally confront somebody about all these different connections, they start now talking about the connections, right? Well, this happened, and you're like, I can explain that. This happened, well, I can explain that too. They're unrelated. This happened, and, and, you, know, and you have all these things, and you're still trying to explain the first one, but now you're, you have four or five other things that can't be, you know, well, let me get to this one. Well, then, you know, last Sunday morning, you didn't say hi. I, I, I thought I did. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> But they each start sounding trivial. I remember, uh, man, this has been a long time ago, sat across the table from somebody. And uh, matter of fact, I don't, I don't care if they watch it. It was Joe Watson. And uh, he sat across from there. I already had a Pepsi waiting for me at Sherry's and uh, just lit into me for, you know, probably an hour. And, uh, but the things he lit into me about, each one was so stinking trivial. And things he read into that just weren't there. And so, but you know, and I'm sitting there thinking, none of this, but the whole heap of evidence? Okay, fine, yeah, I guess you're angry. But you know, and I tried to piece things together, but there came a certain point where I'm like, you know what, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 held, I handled everything wrong, I'm sorry. But I knew they were on their way out anyways. You know, hey, man, have a good life. If there's going to be anything I can do to help you, I've obviously failed you. And, uh, but... No real case is made. It's just a bunch of little things. So number six, your attitude then causes sloppy work. Who cares anyway? Insert a name there. This person doesn't like me anyway and is trying to, whatever you found from number five. Computer language here. See, being on time is no longer important. Double checking work for completeness is, never, is not important. Thoroughness is now lost. Everything is thrown together and nothing is planned. Well, he didn't invite me. I'm going to have my kid late for their for her class. Oh, passive aggressiveness. That's that. I, I, what, that's in Galatians. You said you talked about that this morning. One of the fruits of the spirit is passive aggressiveness, and uh, it's in the Greek. Number seven. You begin to reject blame for your wrong. How about this? I had an affair because my husband or wife was not meeting my needs. Yeah, I may have done wrong, but it's still not my fault. It's that preacher's fault who hurt me. This is all God's fault. I can't pay my bills because of my employer. <laughs> what in the world are you going to come up with? All these things, by the way, case building, are why my attitude stinks. But you never come to this realization. You mean I might have something to do with my problems? Gas, right? <gasps> Number eight, all of a sudden now you cannot respect authority. All those stupid police. Hey, like if, you, if, you, if you're a friend of me on Facebook, you've probably seen the comment pop up every now and then. I disagree with police uh, parked on the side of 126 and, and radar and heat. I disagree. They speed down 35th. They speed down, you know, Main Street I got past the other day by si about 60 miles an hour while I was doing 35. Matter of fact, we're sitting in this room. And I was just praying for a cop to be down there to pull the guy over. Right, Nathan? <laughs> and I, but no, he's parked over on 126 because you want to catch somebody who's doing 64 and a 55. 
instead of the guy that's doing 60 in a, four, in a 35. Or the guy that's driving down my street. I wish they'd put a speed bump on my street. Or put a checkered flag down at the end, you know, a flag stand. You know, so when the guy finally gets down there, you know. Remember that, you ever go, you ever go to those old Roseburg races? Back in the day, if you ever went there? There was a guy, he'd kick his other leg, you know, it was kind of fun to watch. You know, have that down there. Uh, or a good speed bump. But anyways, but I, if, they, if they show a picture of themselves on, you know, 42nd Street or 126, I start, hey, listen, I'm a fan of our police department. But can you please... Patrol the neighborhoods first. You know, no kids are walking across 126. No kids are off on the side of 126 playing and throwing their football back and forth. You know, what's the danger of somebody going 10 over on 126? But I still respect authority when, I'm, when I make the statement. God doesn't command respect for a good husband. I'm a, God doesn't command love for just a good wife. Do, God doesn't command respect for authority only when it agrees with you. God commands us to do those things even when the other person isn't doing what they're supposed to. You don't agree with what pastor said, do you? How much sense does he have? I mean, come on. He still allows that woman who hates me to be, given, to be a beginner class teacher. Right? All right, let's keep on going. You start snapping at people. Honey, what? What's wrong with you? Nothing! And at this point, you're like, yeah, don't care what's wrong, right? It, it's not going to happen in public. You know, you, you, you come to the beginner class door, Lisa comes up, said, your kid has a cold. Well, he might not have a cold if you didn't have a draft in this room. Which, by the way, we fixed that with all, you know, no, the windows open over there. I know it gets a little musty, but maintenance for the, uh, anyways. Or I come to you and say, hey, can you be on time for your class? And you look back at me and say, I don't know, can you end the sermon on time? That's never happened, by the way. But I envision it happening one day. If Judd had a class, it would be the thing that would be said. Matter of fact, Judd would show up late one week just so I would say it, just so I'd be baited in, just so it would happen. Number 10. What? <laughs> All right, number 10. You start getting hard towards people and God. Bitterness really starts to take, uh, take root at this point. Why didn't... There is a... Come here, there was a good family that you know, ended up with cancer, had all these different things. I don't say they ended up with cancer because of that, but when somebody goes through that, man, as a pastor, I want to be there for that family. I want to help that family and to watch what they went through without with being churchless. Uh, now they live in Portland, their kids... It, it, it's... But when they left, they were angry. I'm like, what happened? And I, I talked to him. You didn't show up when my wife was having surgery. Yeah, we don't talk about making me feel bad. But you know what my reply was? I didn't know your wife was having surgery. I had no idea. Well, we told your wife. <laughs> okay, so she forgot to give me a message. But now you're leaving the church. By that time, they were so angry but the, that there was no other choice. It was a misunderstanding. <laughs> we now have three pastors' wives in here. As Pastor Matt said, you know, we have enough pastors. And uh, I can't say the other saying. What is it, Angela? Too many cooks in the kitchen? Yeah, whatever it is. And uh, before, I said, too many chiefs, not enough Indians. But apparently, you can't say that anymore. I'd get canceled, and we would have to, you know, name our church... Uh, the church in Springfield, or, you know, what is it, Washington football team now? Anyways. Three pastor's wives. Why did I say that? That was going to be a good point. What? Messages. Oh, did you know the pastor's wives aren't on staff? Did you know the pastor's wives actually have no calling in office at all? It's just my wife. She happens to take on a pretty good load because she's the pastor's wife, but... Yeah. It's not up to her to get messages to me. Same with the other two. They you know, pull a heavy weight around here. Great. But they kind of are default because they're our wives. There is no official office of pastor's wife. Anyway, keep on going. Um, maybe this is when you, know, you see somebody who's homeless and said he deserves what he gets. Maybe he should get a job like everyone else. That is cold hard. 
Someone you don't like gets sick. Well, God is showing him. That's one way to make sure that person recovers and does well, by the way. God, you know, yeah, what are you saying? You know, make sure I heal them and you know, then somehow make your paths cross. Uh, so number 11. You dis- disassociate from certain people. In church it looks like, uh, you know, certain, you know so and so, he's just like the pastor. You know, you see one, you see the other. Um, this, pa- this couple that I talked about that came to me after church, I should have seen it a year and a half previous. I, with, before we were not into a King James church, but then we came to a King, King James church. Come to find out the other two couples didn't, weren't necessarily in agreement there, which is fine. But then I corrected something I said because I most of the stuff I memorized, I had memorized in IB. And so I said something, and I corrected it. And then, man, you're my pastor's name was Helfrich. Yeah, you're a little, you're a little Helfrich, aren't you? What's this about? Wow. Uh, at your work, it looks like yeah, he's a yes man and a suck up. Uh, in a marriage, it looks like look at them. They think they have the perfect marriage. I can't stand to be around them. Now, how about this? Pastor says they never fight. Talk about unhealthy. He obviously just controls her. She isn't allowed to have her own opinion. Whatever. That's never been said. As a matter of fact, it probably has been. And friendships, it looks like this. We used to be close, but now you've changed. Has everybody ever looked at you and said that? I thought people said that. You've changed. Most of the time it comes from someone who's uh, going down this path and not someone who wants your best interest. Number 12. Then the love, your love for the work of God starts to die. Now this is talking about church, obviously. But remember, it's everyone else's fault. You might even skip baptisms, which by the way, nobody does. So it's, it's, in, the, it's in the outline. By the way, at this point, everyone knows something is wrong, but no one feels safe to ask. Right? Have you ever had that? Where you, you know somebody's upset at church? And every time they come in, it's just like, whoa. Everybody feels it. You come up and ask me, hey, what's going on with so-and-so? I don't know. Well, is somebody going to ask? No. <laughs> Number 13. You ready? You vent your anger with a little cutting of marks. Nice haircut. Nice car. I wish I could afford one. Hey, Dave, you got a little something on your nose there, buddy. Or how about this one? Here, stand in the door and talk to me. <laughs> I told you in the sermon this morning. That's what I wrote down there. <laughs> Comments to people who cannot help the situation is called gossip. You said it in front of Becca, so that's fine. You know, I did hear this one time. Women's opinions just don't matter here. Whatever. It's like we can, it's like we can shut them up, you know? The, their opinion. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> You're telling me that there's a Pastor Appreciation Month? <laughs> Didn't we just give that guy a raise? I, I tell you what. I know that the, you're being reached out. I was mortified when I saw these green pieces of paper over here on the table. It's, I did not solicit this. I'm glad that you appreciate us, but you know somehow it's, it's still embarrassing. Uh, then I saw your list of stuff. And I'm like, wait, I should have put that on mine. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, so just know that comes from Becca, not from us. But, uh, or how about these little cutting remarks? Must be nice. (laughs) Matt and I have said that to each other for years now. Must be nice. But then it's, watch this, it's comments to dogs, kids, and babies when you're really talking to the parents. You know, now the Burkheads have a cat, right? And so you walk up and you start petting the cat and you're talking to the cat and you say, oh, you meowed at me. Your dad won't even talk to me half the time. <laughs> you're holding your kid. Oh, you have such a pretty smile. You know, you're, your dad never smiles. You know, or, you know, oh, those are nice uh, shorts. You know, your dad must, man, must have been a nice paycheck last month. You ever had that where people talk to your cat or your dog or your kid instead of you? All right, let's keep, I got to move forward quickly. What's funny is, as a pastor, you're on the receiving end of these comments, but I can never fire back. Uh, it's interesting. Maybe your cutting remarks, by the way, are only to your spouse, kids, and or your own pet. Maybe, you know, you've isolated yourself so much now, you know, the, your cutting remarks are only to your spouse. 
And so don't think, well, I never dedicated a mark to the person. Well, maybe you're saying to somebody else. Number 14. And this is where you start getting in trouble. You urge others not to get involved. Why are you putting so much effort into this? Come on, man, you're making the rest of us look bad. So remember, your work is slipped, so you don't respect authority. You have dissociated from certain people. The more people you can get to your cause, the more right you seem. Right? If I can get other people with me, then wait, I'm more right. That doesn't make you more right. That just adds to the wrong. You usually don't sin alone. And my question still is, why can't people just leave a church without trying to rope some of what they perceive as fringe people to come along? It doesn't happen here, but you know, it, you, you, you see it. Number five, 15. You ready? You quit going to church functions. What was once important no longer is. And again, this may not be uh, very close to you know, work, marriage, stuff like that. But it could be in marriage. All of a sudden all your in-laws get together and you, you know, don't show up. But you no longer go to work functions. The newness wears off and all the other excuses. I'm going to describe to you a group of religious fanatics. You ready? It's just a couple hours every day. It's regular meetings. There are dietary suggestions and pressure. Child care is provided. $200 a month. And then we actively tell other people about our belief. And you know what? We provide a sense of belonging and community. Did I just describe church? Or did I just describe sports? Did I just describe CrossFit? Which, by the way, I'm not against sports, not against CrossFit. But, uh, you know, <laughs> never mind. I could describe something else, like uh, being a vegetarian. Um, and again, number 16. So next you develop a disinterested face. Now, when I look up here in a second, if you have a disinterested face, you know I'm talking about you. You cross your arms. You know, it's funny. I sit like this. Yeah, you know, there's like Ross back there. You know, I, I sit like this. And during Sunday school, I try to be careful because I'm sitting back there. I generally lean back, cross my arms. And then I'm thinking, wait, how does Matt take this? He knows that's how I sit. But then, oh, wait, i got to look interested. And, uh, you know, sit forward and, you know, kind of nod occasionally, laugh at the occasional joke. And, uh, which, by the way, I am interested when I'm, when I'm in, my, in, my, in my Sunday school class. Your, my Sunday school class. It's your Sunday school class. I mean, it's... I'm part of that Sunday school class. My Sunday school class is a part of it. See, he just called it his Sunday school <laughs> So the number 17, you deny that there's a problem when confronted. Chances of somebody confronting you at this point are very slim because you know what? They know something's wrong and just don't want to deal with it. Um, uh, let's not cover the points there. Number 18, you suddenly quit. You know, where's so-and-so? There's many, many examples of people who just walked away and you, you've seen them. I'm talking about work. I'm talking about marriage where just all of a sudden they look up and just say, I'm done. I'm done. Number 19, you quit God. Well, in the case of you know, church, but you know, marriage, friends, or some, something like that. Because after all, God didn't approve of your handling of all this in the first place. Because you didn't follow the biblical principles on number one, we now get down to number 19. And you know what? God's the problem here. We are in bad situations mostly because we violate biblical principles and so then we turn around and get mad at God for them. Now I want you to catch this statement. Well, this is the biggest lie that I can think of. Well, I'll quit church but I'll still love God. Huh. How do you love God and quit the very institution His Son died for? Because people who quit church eventually do quit God, even if there is a facade. Number 20. You might come back, but you only come back halfway. <clears throat> Alright, now what to do? How do we avoid this? And again, we're only five minutes over right now. That's pretty good. How in the world do I keep, on going down, keep from going down this path and ruin relationships of generations? Um, <clears throat> it happens. <clears throat> Because remember, this whole thing... Okay, number one, realize God allowed you to get hurt. God allowed it. It doesn't mean God caused it. It doesn't mean it was in His will, but God allowed it. Now the question is, how will you deal with it? You've been hurt. Now deal with it. That stops at number one. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able 
and now catch this, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Whenever you have a situation, there is an escape. We just choose not to take it most of the time. Realize that the hurt was the result of sin and not God's will. And probably, again, not the person's fault. That, uh, or, you know, it could have been such a small thing. Number two, admit bitterness is a sin because it's easier to cure before it festers. Hebrews talks about that root going down and then how will it defile and affect those people around us. And I, you know, I think about the woman across the street who lived there, not the woman presently, and how you know, it affected the other people. And now she's not in church. Now she's dying alone because another woman didn't like that I was requesting that they dress a certain way in the nursery. Imagine that. <laughs> now I just you know, I'd just be in the nursery. Who cares? Number three. Number three, keep your respect for the authority and for those around you. Romans chapter 13 is still in the Bible. doesn't mean you have to agree with it. You know, you know, the pastor of the church, I'm not above question. I'm not above anything. You, if you have a you know, disagreement, let's talk. I don't understand how people make it through the world without being a Christian and without Christ. I don't understand that at all. It just baffles my mind. Number four, be open to the authority or people involved who would have stopped the entire process. Again, I believe Paul when he says, hey, it's better to suffer wrong. Go ahead and let yourself be defrauded. You know, in marriage, I would rather allow myself to be defrauded than to have, not, have a fight. I would rather just default. Whatever you want's fine. And again, I make the point, you, you sit there, well, that's unhealthy. It's been unhealthy for over 30 years now. We're, I think we're going to make it. But could all have been stopped by having the right attitude toward our own hurt, which is going to happen, and being honest? Remember the guy throwing his wallet into the porta potty? Don't show it yet. Why did he go in? He went in because of a quarter. He didn't go in to chase his wallet. He didn't go in to chase his credit cards. He didn't go in to chase his car keys or his wedding ring. Let's go, let's go ahead and show him what he looks like right now. He's a happy guy. And yes, this is what you find when you search man in porta potty. Go ahead and leave that one up there. But if you asked him, he'd say, My wallet's down there. What? <laughs> He's still down there justifying going in after the quarter. He's still miserable, but putting on a happy face. I still love God. Do you think this guy here imagined being in a porta potty? Feigning happiness and justifying his own place down there? All life forgetting, he went down there over a quarter. And the quarter grew into life changing events. A quarter. Let's not go down this list, okay? You with me on it? I'll try not to go down the list. I know that I go down this list a lot. I find myself number four, back up. Get back down to one, get back to zero, make my way all the way down to seven, you know, then back up. So I do it too. But let's not go down this list because we're all vulnerable to it. Father, again, we're thankful for our time. Pray. To